Hi everyone, welcome to Frontlist Media Spotlight Session. So this month, February month topic is impact of Amrit Kal budget on the education sphere. So our Union Finance Minister Nirmala Sitharaman referred to the term Amrit Kal while re uh, presenting the Union budget on 1st Feb February 2023. She said we are marking Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav and have and entered into the Amrit Kal, the 25 year long lead up to India at the rate 100. The budget, uh, this year's budget lays a parallel track of a blueprint for the Amrit Kal, which is futuristic and inclusive, directly benefiting youth, women, farmers, and the scheduled, uh, uh, scheduled caste and the scheduled tribes. So this year's budget for the education landscape is relatively high from the previous year. And we are, as a part of publishing industry, plays an integral role in shaping the education sector. And this year's budget will directly influence all the verticals of the literary community. So through this discussion, we are trying to um, strike up a conversation like how this uh, allocated budget impacts our Indian education sector and, and the integration of uh, government institutions like uh, um, New, uh, National Book Trust India and Children Book Trust to develop the comprehensive education infrastructure and setting up the digital library. So um, before diving into the session, uh, let me, uh, please allow me to introduce the panelists. So we have, uh, first panelist, we have Neera Jain. Neera Jain is a managing director of Scholastic India Private Limited and is the chairman of Fikri Publishing Committee. Neera Jain is a finance specialist by training. He, discover, he, uh, he discovered his interest in reading and education once he joined Scholastic. Since 2002, he has been working closely with the global teams of Scholastic to bring out the best works, reading programs, proven pedagogy, and latest developments to support the changing pace of education in the Indian classroom. Served as the president for the Association of Publishers in India from 2020 to 2022. During his tenure as president, he led the creation of a report on Indian publishing ecosystem titled Value Proposition of Indian uh, Publishing with EY Paradion team. So welcome, sir. We are glad to have you on board today. Thank you very much. Next on panel, we have uh, Mr. Kapil Gupta. Kapil Gupta is an entrepreneur, both in thought and style, who believes that the power of a message and its delivery is what causes true revolution. He is a parallel entrepreneur who believes in providing true meaning to the various organization he runs and built them in sync with one another. A simple man with a simpler living and a clarity of thought, the luxuries of his corporate success do not restrict him from delving deeper into the causes and the tonality of our social construct. Trying to understand these nuances is a fundamental to all his businesses. Though he does not believe in the socialist principles of the force, uh, forceful equality, he dreams of uplifting the disadvantage through creating a wider scope of prosperity. He is a co-founder of OML, uh, OM Logic Consult uh, Consultancy Private Limited, Frontless Media, Pragati E, uh, and Advikto. Uh, welcome, sir. We are immensely glad to have you on board today. Welcome. Uh, last but not the least, we have Mr. Pradeep Arora. Pradeep Arora is associated with various social religious welfare and book trade association in a proactive manner. He served Federation of Publishers and Booksellers Association in India for over 18 years in different capacities as office bearers, treasurer, joint secretary, honorable secretary, vice president, not presently he is the president of FPBAI. He remained chairman media, public relation and newsletter committee, chairman a newsletter committee. Uh, Co-chairman membership, subs uh, subscription and screening committee and chairman legal committee devoted for the welfare of Indian book industry. He has authored a number of articles on spirituality with the blessing of Sri Sai Baba Sridi, uh, which were published in a leading international renowned newspaper, magazines such as Sai Leela Times and Sai Saga. Thank you so much uh, for joining us today. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Frontline. Uh, media Thank for you. you know giving us an opportunity to interact with it. such you know giants of our industry having an uh, good experiences you know in finance at all. However, I'm not a, a finance people, but still you know it's great to be with you. Thank you. So today we'll be talking about the union budget on the education sphere. So my first question to everyone: to this uh, union budget, 
this year essay uh, will it will assist in uh, eradicating issues such as unemployment poverty and income disparities so over to you kapil gupta um i guess if i look at the last 40 uh, union budgets i'm 45 year old so that's when i learned how to uh, you know hear and understand what people are saying every union budget for the last 40 years would have said we are in favor of providing support to women providing support to youth providing support to schedule caste schedule tribe providing support to farmers okay i don't see anything new in that sense okay uh, in terms of the details while there is amazing stuff that i see in the formulation of the national education policy if we can implement you know even small bits and pieces from there i think we would have done a long way i'm not really sure about the budget though okay thank you over to you mr neeraj jain okay thank you uh, i think i have a slightly different take than kapil and i think that is good because you know if you are in a panel discussion if you guys have uh, you know if all of us have slightly different dimensions that we can add then it makes uh, a whole some experience for the listeners so my view is that you know while every budget will talk and what couple said is completely correct that every budget will talk about those same stereotype lines but the point is you know what are the details of the budget and everything lies in the details of the budget as i always say if you are looking at eradicating as you said unemployment poverty and income disparity over a period of one year time impossible task but what is important is is that is this budget taking us towards it and my answer to this would be that would be yes and why do i say so because of the emphasis on infrastructure development agriculture and not just talking about the financial support but also investment in infrastructure for uh, agriculture and thirdly startups if you look at all the these three points these are the three points which which would lay the foundation of moving towards it last but not the least is the focus on the education because when the education goes down to the last mile that's when poverty can be eradicated that's when we can tackle unemployment and that's when the income disparity gets thank you neeraj sir over to you mr pradeep aruda what's your take yeah they when we see the overall budget it was uh, futuristic and uh, growth oriented and lays a foundation for the year 2047 when india will be celebrating its 100 years of independence the budget has uh, uh, focused on every sector and will benefit every section of the society giving the uh, impetus to the uh, atmanirbhar bharat vision so there are uh, two main uh, reasons behind india's rising inequality the first and foremost reason is the regressive taxation system and the second is reduced social spending by the union governments so higher inequality leads to lower attainment of education the training skills and all and uh, uh, just i have an um, uh, just an example in the year 1910 sweden used to be one of the wo- world's most unequal countries today it is one of the most equal countries in the world that was made possible by uh, redesigning its tax system into a progressive one redeveloping a system of public health and education like nobody has seen before therefore the onus is on the government to increase the budget expenditure on education and health so most uh, these developed countries around 6% of the gdp on education they spend however in india the spending for the education is only 2.9% actually should be much more uh, the fight against the uh, the poverty depends heavily on education spending on education contributes to economic growth and uh, raises the national gdp which is lacking in budget the increase of tax rebate from rupees 5 lakh to 7 lakh is appreciable however but that will you know uh, up to some extent benefit the middle class but the budget highlights the core vision of the prime minister narendra modi is it to bring out schemes for the welfare of the poor and the lower middle class this year the budget is just a beginning in eradicating issues of unemployment poverty and income disparities however 
repay almighty that the government gets success and the budget uh, assists in eradicating such issues thank you thank you pradeep sir so my next question in the union budget 2023 india has allocated 2.9% of its gdp to the education sector while countries like us and china spend a considerable amount of their gdp on education will the allocated money be enough for it considering the uh, education loss india faced during the pandemic so i'll start with kapil sir kapil you are good are unable to listen you sorry uh, yeah, no. so 2.9% in a country like india with the kind of other issues that we have with us still uh, being considered as partly an agrarian society with the kind of benefit schemes and all that we need to run uh, in terms of social subsidies and all uh, i mean the ground reality is allocating more than 2.9% so significantly more than 2.9% is probably not really very feasible i think we need to look at the some of the more underlying ground issues in terms of social social subsidies in terms of you know our spending on various other areas before we start harping on this question of what is our percentage spending vis-a-vis -vis other countries so in that sense i think 2.9% i think that's a that's a very reasonable number just you're on mute thank you uh over to you mr uh, neeraj jain okay so i again uh, i i second what uh, kapil has said that you know sometimes it's not about the percentage and uh, mr roward said about 6 percentage being allocated by various different economies point is that you know every country faces different challenges and different issues and when you're putting down the budget together you have to consider where you can put what it's similar to the way we run our own household budgets right for me important is not whether it is 2.9 or can it be 3.2 or 3.5 important is where is this 2.9% that we have allocated in the budget that's going to be spent in and will we end up spending the amount because what we have seen over the past past decades is you know we allocate some of sums of money for the education but towards the end of the budget period we realize that we have not spent that amount i think what is very important and that was also one of the questions that was raised at the sticky meeting when we were discussing budget with uh, uh, nirmala ji uh, it was how to ensure that the allocated money is spent especially in education because education is a is, is a subject which is handled both by center and state so center by itself cannot spend all this money unless and until states come back with their own proposals right so i think very very important fact here is if this 2.9% is available how does government plan to spend that money and that money getting spent on the right causes that would pave the path and then future we might have more budgets but i think for now let's focus on where to spend this money thank Absolutely. you so much neer sir so over to you mr pradeep arora <laughs> yeah uh, we have you know uh, mr kapil gupta and neeraj jain you know their uh, remarks about it Uh, so as far as the uh, covid is concerned you know the uh, in, in that period uh, the impact was everywhere the worldwide uh, lockdowns you know because of the global pandemic have uh, affected many important uh, sectors adversely and one of the uh, uh, one of them you know the major was the education sector so the pandemic forced many schools colleges universities coaching centers and educational institutions to keep them closed you know for a long so as the spending on education contributes to the economic growth and raises the national gdp that most developed countries spends as i mentioned you know about 6% on the education our india it's just 2.9% which uh, as um, so neeraj then said that if it is 3.2 or 3.5 you know that ultimately but that matters as well because you know the more money we have the more you know budgets we will be having so we will be sharing those uh, uh, among you know other uh, all the places uh, you know wherever they want to put put all of them so as we have seen you know that uh, in U us about 6% of the gdp and in china is about 4% uh, gdp they are spending on this education the overall you know uh, allocation of the education uh, sector in the united Uh, in the union this budget 23 has increased by around 8.3% so 
to rupees 1.13 lakh crores compared to 1.0 uh, lakh crore allocated in the last year. However, it is still far achieving the uh, national educational policy target to increase the spending on education to 6% on the GDP. So currently the share of education as a percentage of GDP remains so low, about less than 3%, which is marginally for the higher education sector, which saw an uptick of around 8% in the allocation of 44,094 crores from 40,828 crores in 23. So in order to implement the national educational policy of the 2020, the allocation has been made for overall development of the best institutes and universities. Well, grant to university grant to UGC, the University Grant Commission, has been increased 9.3%. That is an increase of around 459 crores. So it may be emphasized that the book trade has been visioned as the noble industry and may rightly be graded as number two after the defense sector. So considering uh, the loss in educational sector during the pandemic, which is actually uh, uh, the question, in my opinion, the government has not allocated enough money into that. They should uh, they should actually allocate some more funds into those that could have been much better. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving such uh, different perspectives. So my next question. So um, what is the uh, vision of the Indian government behind setting up the digital libraries, which is mentioned by Nirmala Sita Adamans? and the budget, and how will they benefit in creating new prospects for the students? So I'll start with Kapil Gupta. Um, can you repeat that second part again, please? Uh, what is the vision of the Indian government behind setting up the digital libraries, and how will uh, they benefit in creating new prospects for the students? See... Uh, digital library is a very interesting question. Um, I would actually, instead of answering it myself, I would actually want to first hear the point of view from people that come from the publishing industry who probably have a much larger stake versus me talking purely as a user. I think let's have the experts uh, kind of give their point of view before I talk as a user. So please so, start here. Uh, Pradeep ji, Neeraj, if you can please... Uh, throw light on this. I know it impacts right. the publishing industry very significantly. Okay. Yes, so, so my view here is that, you know, again, if you look at it and I would add one more point to it, the focus in the budget has been on the digital libraries as well as the physical libraries. Now, those are the two very important steps if you look at it from the budget perspective. And now I'll relate it back to the learning loss. We are all talking about the learning loss that the pandemic has related, resulted in. Also, couple it up with the report which says more than 60% of the students in grade 5 cannot read grade 2 level text. If you, if you go to the root of that problem, the root of that problem lies in reading. Because reading is a very, very integral part of building a language. And also in terms of, you know, you first learn to read and then you read to learn. Right? So if you cannot learn to read, then you cannot read to learn. And with that emphasis in mind, I think the physical libraries and the digital libraries have been brought in, brought in. Digital libraries per se, because we have, what we've seen is that, you know, that's that makes it accessible to all. And physical library infrastructure, which is lacking in our country, will take its time to get developed. So easier bit to build up is the digital library structure. And and as as, as a part of the research that Scholastic does into reading. Reading stands on four pillars and the first top, first and foremost pillar for reading is excess and the second one is choice. I think with the setting up of digital libraries, the intent of the government is to provide excess of books to everybody. I think that's a very welcome move. Couple it up with the physical libraries so that what is important is that each, each child gets to use a book in the format that they want to use and then they can consume the content which is again up to their choice. Having both physical and digital libraries will make sure that the access is available on both sides. And then the child who loves digital can go digitally and read the book and the child who loves physical book can go and pick up a physical book to read. That would be my take on. Thank you, Neera, sir. So what do you, Mr. Pradeep Arura? 
yeah uh, as you know that uh, uh, our finance minister uh, nirmala sitharaman ji announced you know a national digital library to be set up for children and adolescents living in all parts of the country to facilitate the availability of quality books the digital library will facilitate the availability of books across languages geographies genres and levels however states will also be encouraged to set up physical libraries for the children in panchayats and ward levels as well to provide infrastructure for assessing the national digital library resource this uh, national book trust and uh, this uh, children book trust both will have books in local languages as well as in english as uh, uh, to the physical english at, for the physical libraries so this national digital library of india you know which uh, is an uh, all digital library that uh, stores information about different types of digital contents including books articles videos audios pcs and other educational materials relevant for users from varying educational levels and uh, capabilities so it provides a single window research facility so that learners can retrieve the digital the right uh, uh, resources with the least efforts in minimum time and this national digital library of india is designed to hold contents of any language and provide interface support for the leading uh, vernacular languages so it is available on all popular forms of access device including mobile apps android and ios platforms so this uh, uh, national digital library has been designed to benefit all kinds of users like the students of all levels even teachers researchers librarians even library users professionals and differently able users and other uh, lifelong learners so it will provide a single window research facility uh, to act as a one stop shop for all the digital educational resources in in addition to this you know the government has also proposed a multi sector focus on reforms through technology driven and the knowledge based mechanism during the samrit kal so this uh, our finance minister particularly you know uh, on uh, this national digital library she uh, said that our vision for the amritkal includes technology driven and knowledge based economy with strong public finances and a robust financial sector so to achieve this the uh, jan bhagirathi which you know uh, our uh, pm has said the sabka saath sabka prayas so that is very much essential you know uh, in this case so the vision of the indian government behind setting up the digital libraries is great and it will definitely be benefited in creating a, a new prospects for the students thank you at last over to you kapil gupta okay well both the experts think it's a great idea uh, for me personally uh, i think it's a brilliant idea i have always believed in if you want to remove any sort of equality provide equal opportunity and how you provide equal opportunity in this kind of a world is you know enable it digitally have it available with everyone we have such an incredible digital reach in our country right now that it it promises to be able to remove all barriers across everything so digital library essentially means the same content is available to the poorest of the student as is available to the most rich student it is devoid of uh, any you know differentiation of location of you know uh, of uh, of your economic prosperity of your social prosperity and anything else in fact i remember many years back uh, i was having a long discussion with somebody in the up education and and i'm talking about before they started that other uh, laptop scheme uh, with akhilesh yadav and one of the things that that i told them is hey why da, why are you doing this stupid thing of giving laptops to every student why don't you simply make the classrooms as digitally enabled put us to put this world class student sorry world class teacher in some corner uh, you know in delhi okay and have that class be beamed across all classrooms in up and change the teacher from a teacher to a facilitator every 10 minutes of lecture there is 5 minutes of break in which students get to interact with their teacher ask questions and doubts and everything else and the classroom works fundamentally well and it's now uh, you know uh, it's same environment that you get everywhere of course that idea was 
extremely disliked uh, at that point of time. And then came COVID and everybody started jumping on that bandwagon. So I think digital library will go a huge way in taking care of such biases. Thank you so much. So Nirmala, the, uh, our finance minister also mentioned the PNE Vidya program. So in this program, there will be uh, 200 D, uh, DTH channels de uh, dedicated to the classes 1 to 12 that will provide supplementary education in regional languages for classes 1 to 12. What's your take on this, for, um, uh, especially for this program? So I would like to start with Needle Chen. I'll, I'll give a very short answer to it. In a country like ours, if you have to make it make it reach to the households, so the best way to make it reach is through either the channels or through digital media. I, from that perspective, a very good step going forward because that's again, as, as we said about the digital library, it will take it to everybody. And, the, and there cannot be any better way to take it to everybody other than this. I still remember when the televisions were launched and there were not so many channels as we see today. We would even sit down and watch Krishi Darshan. Not that I had to go into agriculture. But that's the mode and that is what happens when you have a television in front of you, even in the smallest or remotest of the village. So if you can beam it, perfect. Okay, get it to everybody. Thank you. So over to you, Mr. Kapil Gupta. Um, I mean... I'm a digital marketing guy, so <laughs> I can't speak in favor of DTH. Uh, no, jo jokes aside, I think mobile phones in our country have a far greater reach now than DTH does. Good idea. Uh, I mean, it's the same content that will be beamed on digital, that will get beamed on TV. Use all the mediums possible. I mean, for heck, for all I care, put the same content and print it in a newspaper as well. Exactly. Um, the more, the better. But... There is no replacement of digital at this point of time, considering the penetration. A few years back, in fact, pre-COVID, if you had asked me a day before COVID started, I would have agreed 100% with uh, Neeraj that the best way is to put it on uh, on you know TV. Uh, I'm not sure if that's the best mechanism now because of the reach of digital, simply because of that. Otherwise, of course, as many mediums as you can, it's a wonderful idea. It's all about everything existing together, Kapil. Absolutely. Put it up all, all, all in all, all through all the mediums. As you rightly said, put it up into a print in the newspaper. All. Exactly. Great. What about those uh, uh, don't have the access to the smartphones? So how will we be able to you know, um, sustain the digital libraries? You know, we have uh, more, we have from more smartphones, more feature phones. Let me not use the word smartphones. We have more feature phones in this country than the entire population of the country at this point of time. So <laughs> I I hear you, but uh, I mean, yeah, I know. I I I, I think that's a uh, that's not important at this point of time. Once you have crossed this boundary, think about how do you kind of uh, even reach to that place. But I I think it covers it all. Okay, thank you. So what do you, Mr. Pradeep Aroda? So what's your yeah, take on PME Vidya program? Yeah, what I feel is, you know, that the government uh, uh, plan is high quality e-content in all spoken languages, you know, which will be developed for delivery via internet, mobile phones, TV, and uh, through radio and uh, digital features. So a competent, uh, competitive, you know, mechanism for uh, development of quality content by the teachers will be set up to empower and equip them with digital tools of teaching and uh, uh, facilitate, you know, better learning outcomes. So this initiative is actually a mind-blowing one, which I feel is. It's a good initiative and we hope that under the PME with the program, the 200 DTA channels dedicated to class 1 to 12 will be a great, uh, to a great extent, you know, will enable all these states to provide supplementary education in uh, regional languages. Thank you. So in the budget, the government also announced the opening of new nursing schools and 100 labs. However, will the government be able to sustain them? Please express your thoughts. So I would like to start with Neera, uh, Neera Jensen. So I'll be very honest. Uh, I'm One, I'm not very uh, equipped to answer this question. Right? Having not dealt with nursing schools, having not dealt with the labs in, in my capacity, uh, I can only give you a very, very uh, 
you know, superficial answer if I attempt to answer this question. So that's not my forte. If government has thought about it, I'm sure they should have an, a, a, an action plan around it. But uh, since it's not my forte, I'll skip this question because no attempt at trying to answer a question which, which is not my purview. Okay, thank you so much. So what do you Kapil Gupta? Again, uh, you are on... Mute. Kapil, you are on Sorry, uh, I have some experience with nursing school. So let me, uh, you know, provide some insight into that. First of all, let me answer your question of affordability. Uh, Indian government can afford pretty much anything that they want to afford. Okay. I don't think uh, as a country, as an economy, we do not live in a world where we have a, sh you know, shortage of funds to be spent on at least things as important as education and things as important as healthcare. And nursing is a combination of both. Nursing schools are is a combination of both. Secondly, there are a lot of private nursing schools that exist today. I have seen a uh, condition of some of them. Um, I think there is a huge need for a government intervention to standardize everything. Nursing schools in a lot of ways, private nursing schools are almost like vocational training programs where people go just so they can get a job, irrespective of what skill do they acquire there or not. So in that sense, if government can help standardize uh, some of the nursing schools and help create some kind of an infrastructure that provides better nurses. Amazing. Number three, we live in a country where healthcare has, has huge requirements. I mean, uh, the, the economic disparity uh, or the economic structure of the country means there is huge requirements for good quality healthcare and we suffer tremendously with bad nursing. I mean, I'm not talking about nursing is the only problem in the country, but we suffer with bad nursing, which means there are way too many deaths that happen because of, or, uh, you know, fatalities or whether it is infections or whatever else that happens because of, uh, you know, malpractices that happens because of in incompetence and that happens because of shortage of resources. So in that sense, I think this is a wonderful thing uh, for the government to plan on doing. Again, uh, while having said all this, I will end this with, I, you know, I as an individual am only interested in execution, plans and policies. Our traffic rules are the most world-class in the world. But traffic in my city sucks so badly, I can't tell you. Right? So, uh, policies, plans, procedures... Let's see what they can actually execute. Whether when I'm saying standardize, are they actually going to standardize or will they substandard even whatever private nursing schools have? That's of course remains to be seen. Thank you so much. So over to you, Mr. Pradeep Aroda. Yeah, uh, can you just you know repeat the question once again? Uh, with the new budget, the government announced the opening of new nursing schools and 100 labs. However, will the government be able to sustain them? Your thoughts? Yeah. Actually, according to the uh, this uh, national educational policy, the recommendations were uh, made, you know, that uh, uh, ideally, as I already mentioned as well, that, you know, 6% uh, of the uh, gross domestic products GDP that's uh, to be spent. However, uh, uh, that we never reached. You know, the overall allocation of the education sector the budget has increased by around 8.3%, as I mentioned earlier, as well as these data. And uh, uh, the revised, you know, estimate of this allocation will also be revealed today. One of the, uh, as uh, in, in today's, you know, uh, uh, time one of the biggest takeaways from budget 23 is 157 nursing colleges that will be established in the core locations so much of the amount of our all you know on the education sector which has given uh, to the to this sector will be spent you know on this particular uh, uh, on these core locations specifically on these you know new nursing schools and labs you know which they will be Creating. So, this under labs, you know, there will be an engineering institution with various authorities, regulators, these banks, and other businesses for developing application using this 5G service. To realize the new range of opportunities, these business models and the employment potential, 
the labs will cover among others these applications such as a smart classrooms precious farming this intelligent uh, transport system and healthcare applications the government announcement and planning of opening new nursery schools and 100 labs is a very good initiative however despite the harsh and most crucial you know uh, this time of pandemic in the past 3 years we have seen that not much development has taken place however it will be a, a good omen if the government is prepared to carry on this project and take it to uh, next level so we, we wish the government should do it and that will be a great achievement thank you so much uh, so my next question as per the union budget 2023 the government institutions like national book trust india and our children book trust will encourage a reading culture amongst uh, indian citizens however private publisher also have also involved the uh, indian publishing uh, industry over the 75 years how do you look upon the role of private publisher at this moment so i would like to start uh, with mr uh, neeraj jain okay so so while government did mention about the national book trust and children book trust but i think the from the intent point of view it meant that you know they would be the ones who would be uh, spearheading the whole program but that doesn't mean that they are the only ones who do and in my view this is the perfect opportunity for all us private publishers to work together with the government as a public private partnership model which which has always been encouraged because if we have to take physical libraries to every village of this country it is not possible without the help of private publishers and we do have a key role to play it's important for all of us to sit down with the government because the next two months are the most critical one as uh, during the interaction ms uh, nirmala sitaraman said next two months is the time when they build up the road or uh, you know building blocks to achieve this budget so you you put it into the budget that this is what we plan to do now you start you know all the all the government departments will start working on how to put that into execution now so this is the period where all of us will also have to make sure that we are engaging with the government in the right way so that if you have to take this budget forward if you have to have all of these things done it cannot be and and believe me even the government doesn't believe that they can do it through just the nbtcbt nbtcbt has been there their mandate was always to take libraries to every part of the country it will succeed when all of us together work hand in hand with the government to make sure that it gets delivered so role of private publishers i think does not get diminished in any way it is only here up here to increase increase further and it's also to bring on the table what we can do right that's what it thank you so much uh, so mr kapil gupta your take um let me play a publisher's role for a second <laughs> i think the first problem that you need to solve is uh, solve the mission statement for nbt and sahitya academy and you know publication division and all that actually the role of the government the government is not and should not be a publisher okay i'm including ncrt in that regards as well government is not and should not be a publisher publishing should be done by private organization of course how do you regulate people like neeraj and people like pradeep ji and people you know other publishers across the country to ensure there is affordable education is a uh, is a question that needs to be dealt with the answer should not never be the government getting into publishing so i think you know uh, to, to give my point of view i think the government should let the private players the publishers do their job both publishers who are in india as well as publishers that come from out outside the role that nbt and such organization should play is to create the right environment so conducting book fairs opening libraries uh, you know creating more uh, you know larger platforms and collaborations uh, helping with regional publishing in some ways maybe uh, is something that the government can provide support on but being an active publisher whether it is publication division or sahitya academy or nbt i think that role should be stripped off of the role that they play as an organization whether they belong to ministry of external affairs or ministry of education or ministry of culture or whoever else government should not and must not be in the business of publishing thank you so much 
Uh, so over to you, Mr. Pradeep Aruda. Yeah, as you know that uh, uh, in the National Book Trust, there is a thing, you know, National Center for Children's Literature. So it was established to promote, you know, create, coordinate, monitor, and the publication of children literatures in the Indian languages. So this center helps the creation and the translation of useful books for children. And the uh, primary objective of the center is to promote reading habits among children. So that's the purpose of uh, these government agencies, more or less. So, but as far as the role of uh, uh, private publishers is concerned, we have seen, you know, that in the 70, past 75 years, you know, uh, one cannot, uh, these, you know, uh, the role played by the private publishers cannot be ignored or underestimated. In addition to providing high quality books, private publishers also support teachers by way of workshops, trainings, teacher resource material, and lesson plans, the digital content, web support, these question papers, the worksheets, these all, everything, you know, they have been helping into uh, developing those. And, you know, besides this, this uh, publishing industry employs the best of editors, digital content creators and uh, uh, developers as part of their endeavors and commitment to create international quality books at the lowest possible price. And the textbook prices in India are amongst the lowest in the world, um, even lower than some of the developing nations. So the uh, large number of students in India and the volumes enable private publishers to provide textbooks at fairly low price. But the government textbooks are uh, subsidized on taxpayers' money. And hence, they would always be priced lower than the textbooks published by the private publishers. So as the publishing industry in India per se does not get any special incentive or subsidy from the government, even though it is committed towards providing high quality textbooks and contributing to the education in the um, uh, future citizens of India. So the textbooks published by private publishers are made available on time as per the demands and requirements of the schools, the demands of the teachers and demands of the students all over the country. Uh, through the wide uh, network of stockists, distributors, retailers, and everyone. So the publishing industry also employs millions of professionals, you not know, directly or indirectly, who are striving hard to create this uh, and offer you know this high quality content for the betterment of students and the country at large. So ever since the existing of publishing industry, there had not been any taxation, as you have, as you know, you know, there had never been any sale tax. There never be any VAT. So even according to HSN code, uh, uh, the printed books in uh, are you know exempted from GST, whereas the government has otherwise been charging GST from publishing industry indirectly, such as eighteen percent on uh, GST on freelance services of copy editors, uh, illustrators from proofreaders, eighteen percent you know they charge on all the uh, printing bills. As well as, you know, 18% they charge on author's royalties. So it's not understand as to why the publishers are burdened with the, these all payments of GST. This is an additional burden on uh, uh, the publishers and it gives it prices becomes higher. Uh, this Avandra uh, Federation of Publishers and Booksellers Association in India have been, you know, uh, writing about all these facts to the government several times. but nothing is being done, you know, we are not being hurt. You being in media, you know, should uh, uh, came, you know, brought to their brought in light, you know, these kinds of factors that there should be a level playing field. Um, so, Pradeep ji, uh, let me just add one more thing. I personally kind of disagree with, uh, you know, uh, uh, removing GST from all book services. I think the right answer is probably let the book publishers, uh, you know, uh, let there be some GST on books so that there is more leveling that gets done. I'm not saying 18%, maybe it is 5%, maybe it is 3% or 4%. Um, so if I if I take up that issue, I would rather take up the issue saying put a small GST on book publishers so they are able to balance it out. They don't lose anything and then there is added leverage that, that gets created in the country. Kapil, I'll add something. Uh, yes, I agree with your point. There should be a GST on books, not just because of the leveling level playing field, but from a, from a government perspective, we look at it from, from two, three different angles. 
it also brings industry to the stature of an industry absolutely because you can value you can you can you can find the value of it secondly publishing industry faces a bigger challenge from piracy you will be able to control piracy to a large extent because of the because you will bring in the gst last but not the least we also know uh, government works towards you know there has been repeatedly talk about how many people buy big cars how many people go on foreign holidays and how many pay taxes if you want to bring people into under the tax regime these are the best, best ways of bringing the businesses into the right practices rather than leaving them open to uh, for somebody to misuse them i agree the gst actually is one tool which will help you in all the possible problems that the publishing is facing and it also is a big tool to help the government to take things in the right direction so when you guys write about it i think just drop the full picture so that the government is able to understand that it's not just for the benefits of a b or c it's for the truly for the benefit of the government that they should introduce gs yep thank you so much everyone uh, so my last question to all of you that uh, india is a preferred language and is spoken worldwide will the effort of promoting regional languages in the union budget be wise since this notion doesn't support uh, global standards so over to you mr jain thank you good question english is the most preferred language correct it's the most widely spoken language in india again correct. but part that i i have a slight bit of disagreement on global standards global standards can be brought about in any language even in the region so when we talk about global standards they can be brought about in any language the point is that you know if you are promoting regional language how does it help because the child for for every child and and you know for a country as vast as ours there are a lot of first generation learners so the support available at home is only in regional language in the mother tongue and also research has proven that children are able to pick up their mother tongue much faster than anything else i don't think the intent is to take it away from english intent is to first let them comprehend let them get some understanding and then move them towards a, a language because english is going to stay there even when you promote regional language english is not going to go away right so provide the best content the best global standards in both regional language as well as english english would be picked up by our our children very fast if they are well conversant and if they are going to schools even if they are studying in their own mother tongue so i think the intent behind this is is to make sure that every learner gets an equal opportunity to learn and because if you are environment and especially when we talk about the rural environment if your environment is at home is not conducive to a to a language like english then that child is not getting an equal opportunity to learn and grow that would be my point thank you so over to you mr kapil gupta um i have been so for the last some time as you know some of you would know i have been running a mental wellness program and one of the things that i have been you know talking about everywhere i go is you cannot have a thought in a language convert it on the fly in english speak it listen back to what the other person is saying converted translate back. that on the fly in your language and then kind of come up with the result <laughs> too many translations too much processing power being used it doesn't work i'm not saying do an education where you change the meaning of or the, the calling of the word technology to pradyogiki i'm not suggesting yeah. you do that you keep the basic tenets as global standards absolutely do that don't call one as ek i i i i can still argue on uh, on that but beyond that the entire education if you make it regional it will have such an amazing such an amazing inroads you know there is a reason why when you look at engineers and doctors and you know other occupations in, in this country you see a more metro crowd you see a more city crowd and you don't see that much rural crowd because they suffer from that translation i mean they yeah. can't do it in their heads 
I go travel to so many different places and I actually struggle with it at times because I will be going to, uh, you know, a place like Jabalpur to do a workshop and people there speak Hindi. For them, English becomes a problem. And I, with you know, uh, with my colonial hangover, has have become a person that can't speak Hindi that fluently, specifically when I'm talking about subjects, uh, you know, like mental wellness or subjects like digital and all. I think there is a huge need for having something that gets done in regional language. Um, amazing, amazing if the government takes it head on. Uh, you know, Hindi can become the first use case and then you expand it to the four key other languages and then you put it across in all regional languages. That rollout is something that the government can define and can be done in a better manner, but absolutely promote regional languages. Thank you so much. So over to you, Mr. Pradeep Baroda. Yeah, uh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Arora, just can you give me 30 seconds? Uh, uh, sorry, I, I, I'll have to leave uh, in the next two minutes. So I just wanted to thank Frontless Media and thank my co-panelists. It was a very good discussion. Mr. Arora, I would be there for a minute or so to hear your view. I'm sorry, it will be my loss. I would not be able to hear your complete answer. Uh, thank you very much once again. It was a pleasure interacting with all you. Uh, but I, but I agree with your uh, contention, you know, that... Uh, uh, no doubt that this uh, uh, international language is English and most of the scientific and uh, technological advances have been recorded in English language. But as you both have mentioned, you know, Neeraji and uh, Kapilji, that, you know, the people understand much in their own language. So I support both of you in, in this case. My opinion. <laughs> Thank you very much, you know, uh, Friendly's media team. And uh, Neeraji and Kapilji, it's a great, you know, interacting with you and uh, listening to you. I have learned the much, much more uh, things from your end. It's great, great. It's it's reciprocal, sir. We've we've learned it a lot. We've learned a lot from you too. Absolutely, and um, I know uh, Josna has her closing comments to say, but let me also say one more thing. Uh, as frontless media. I think there is a lot of work that has happened with Federation of Indian Publishers. We have done some work with Saitya Academy and other places. I think API and FPBI, and I'm so glad, uh, you know, that it turned out to be the two of you, uh, you know, organized by, uh, by Frontless Media. I think there is a lot more work that we need to do with both API as well as FPBI. So I think, Jyotsna, you should absolutely get in touch with Pradeep ji as well as Neera ji and take this forward so that Frontlist you know, becomes a lot more holistic in terms of its representation. I mean, it already is holistic, but it becomes a lot more holistic. And we integrate point of views uh, that comes from the various different organizations and stakeholders that have key roles to play. And, you know, API and FPBI are, you know, probably uh, one of the best holding bodies in that regards. Thank you so much, Kapil sir. And thank you everyone for joining us today and getting different perspective from the publishing world and from the digital world as well. It is quite a, a good learning uh, to the audience for me as well. So I'm hoping that this session will be beneficial to all, to the everyone who is looking upon what is this uh, take of publishing industry in our, for the Union Budget 2023. So thank you so much. Thank you very much, Josna. Thank you, Josna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Neeraji. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Kapil. Thank you. Thank you, Pradeep ji. Pleasure interacting. <laughs>